Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and uh, welcome to our latest vodcast. And this one's going to be a very interesting topic, something that's been addressed in the literature recently, and something that people often ask us about, and that's the role of CT in the evaluation of acute GI bleeding. And this is an exhibit from the past RSNA, so I didn't break it up in any great uh, detail compared to uh, how the exhibit was, but I thought I'd discuss this with you, and what you'll see on the uh, on CTSS is the entire exhibit, so you can read it in more detail. And this was a, a joint effort, uh, Karen Horton and myself from Hopkins, Brooke Jeffrey from Stanford, and Mike Federley, who's still at Pittsburgh, and of course Mike is now at San Francisco uh, with Brooke at Stanford. So let's get started. Um, there are many new applications in CT we talk about, from colonoscopy to coronary CTA, but one of the things that people often forget that we can do very well is looking at the vascularity of the GI tract. And we see this in articles we've written looking at small aneurysms, looking at small dissections, vasculitis, activity for Crohn's disease. We have a number of different uh, things that we can look at. And the same thing is true with GI bleeding. GI bleeding is always a challenge. We know this from angiography. If the patient's not bleeding at the time of the study, you're going to get a false negative examination. So there always will be challenges, whatever the imaging modality is for detection of GI bleeding. But CT is indeed particularly good for this application. Uh, to do it well, you need to have a current scanner. You need to be at 64 slice CT. And you need to have a really good protocol, fast injections, neutral contrast agents, and I'll talk about this in some detail. So let's just talk about GI bleeding for a moment. Typically we talk about upper GI bleeding, which refers to bleeding proximal to the ligament of trites, which means esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. It accounts for about 70% of all cases of GI bleeding. There's a range of causes from ulcers to ulcerations to erosions to varices. Less common causes include Mallory Weiss, uh, vascular lesions, and of course, neoplasms. Uh, mortality rate is up to 10%. And lower GI bleeding is typically discussed as distal to ligament of trites. So it's really small bowel and colon. Lower GI bleeding is less common than upper GI bleeding, accounting for about 30% of cases. Has a range of causes from diverticular disease in large bowel and angiodysplasia and colon cancer to Crohn's disease and vascular malformations and all sorts of tumors. Mortality rate is a bit lower for uh, uh, these patients, under 4%. Now, if we think about and you look at um, this image, you recognize the importance of really thinking about CT and thinking about the bowel and where sources of bleeding can come. So it can be from the uh, mucosa, you can have ulcerations from medications, it can be from the submucosa, uh, a tumor in this location, and of course it can be from the serosa, like tumor implants are all possibilities. We also recognize, of course, the vascularity of the small bowel, and you can see just from this very nice schematic diagram, thinking about the vessels beyond the SMA and celiac, at the ileocolic and the uh, jejunal branches and the distal ileal branches, are all sites that we need to see. And when you think about these images and just the schematic, you recognize that CT is really good because with thin section CT, we do get a very good look of the patient's arcade. So let's look at uh, the literature for a second. There's not a whole lot published. Cool performed an experiment to evaluate feasibility of CT to detect GI bleeding in a swine model. And uh, in that study, despite using thick collimation, uh, widely spaced cases, they found that CT had the potential to depict bleeding at rates of greater than 0.5 millimeters per minute. So it's something that, again, is uh, was definitely possible uh, when the bleeding was under 0.4 ml per minute. You could see it as long as the enhancement was high enough. So it does make the point that uh, very, very important to have good bolus enhancement. Uh, two published an article looking at 13 patients with acute hemochesia when they went CT scanning. Again, there's an older article, four slice CT, thicker sections, not as fast as scanning. And in about half the cases, a bleeding site was identified. Angiography and embolization was performed and confirmed in five of these seven cases. In the other two cases, surgery you know, confirmed the findings. So you can see in this example, 7 out of 13 were detected, and that's with old technology. 
better than 50%. Jan looked at the role of CT in 26 consecutive patients with acute massive GI bleeding. Um, of patients who had acute upper GI bleeding, only those in whom endoscopy was inconclusive uh, were included in the study. The patients underwent arterial phase CT before an angiogram. Again, it's an older study, four slices, scanners, contrast injected at a reasonable rate, 3.5 ml, and only axial images were reviewed. Uh, in this series, the, uh, the location, base sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy, and positive and negative predictive values for CT were 91%, 99, 97, 95, and 98% respectively. The overall patient-based accuracy for GI bleeding was 88.5%. That's indeed very impressive. Again, when you think about it, they only looked at axial images in our experiences, particularly with small aneurysms. You really need the 3D imaging. And also, it was older scanners. The infections weren't as thick. So again, that's pretty impressive results even at that time. Ernst looked at 19 other patients with acute lower GI bleeding. This was a single detector scan. Um, they found that um, three of 19, they found bleeding, but um, you know the study results weren't great, but again, it's old technology. It's something we don't look at or wouldn't look at these days. Lang um, looked at this as well and considered that the CT does have a role to play. So you can see from the articles, things are evolving. What you've not seen is a really you know, good, well-controlled article at 64 slice CT, and that's what we look at in this, in this study. So what, what are we looking for? We're looking for extravasated IV contrast. So technique becomes critical. You can't use positive contrast. You need to use negative contrast. You also need to have IV. IV rapidly infused. We do 120 cc's, typically around 5 cc's per second. We do 25 and 50 second or 55 second delays. This gives us good opacification of both the arterial and venous side, and we're going to trigger and see any site of active bleeding. Um, some people suggest non-contrast scans because maybe there's some dense material in the bowel from food or pills or from another study, which can be confusing. So I guess that's not unreasonable. Uh, depending on patients, um, you know, renal function, we'll either use Omnipake or we'll use uh, uh, Visipake. So again, saline chasers can be used in these studies as well. And if patients uh, are older, poor renal function will drop contrast volumes to between 80 and 100. In terms of uh, a oral contrast, I like to use water, you can use volumen. You like something to extend the bowel as much as possible, but you don't want a contrast agent. So this is very important. Good bowel distension makes it very easy to pick up smaller uh, areas of bleed. Our technique, we do a 0.75 millimeter thick sections from a, from a scanner with 0.6 millimeter detectors. 0.5 millimeter reconstruction, so there's overlap. So you're getting well over a thousand cases when you're looking at the abdomen. We reconstruct everything so that we can look at it in 3D. I'll scroll through coronals, uh, sagittals. I don't find this helpful except for looking at the proximal celiac and SMA. And then I do a combination of volume rendering and MIP. Again, volume rendering gives me a good look at the soft tissue components of the bowel as well as the vascularity. MIP is a projection technique. So you're trying to find something that's very bright and causing bleeding. So again, um, uh, critical to have these post-processing. The really small vessels are probably best defined on the uh, MIP images. Now, one of the things we commented before about looking at only axial imaging with some of the uh, articles have done, it's very hard to see and follow small vessels. And yes, if you have a large bleed, it's going to be easy, but on axial imaging, there's too much partial averaging. You really need to go beyond axial imaging when you're doing the study. But we do look at the axial images, and they are very helpful. Venous phase imaging is evaluated the same way. Uh, sometimes you do see delayed bleeding, and the venous phase nicely shows that. You'll also be looking for varices. Venous phase is really where you see the impressive varices, particularly lower esophagus and, and uh, gastric fundus, which are not as well visualized on the routine arterial phase imaging. It's just too early. So we said that our ability for detection uh, depends on our ability to identify extravasated IV contrast material. Um, there's many descriptions, linear, jet-like swirls or pools. 
Uh, but again, it's a bright blush, which often washes out quickly if you had non-contrast. You see the difference between contrast and non-contrast. Uh, typically, um, this will enhance literally to a couple hundred Hounsfield units. Important to remember, bowel enhances significantly normally. Don't confuse bright bowel enhancement for areas of contrast extravasation. In an article by Yoon, the authors looked at two different features, extravasation of contrast into the lumen and extravasated contrast having attenuation value of over 90. Now, the authors felt that in most cases, the attenuation of the extravasated contrast will exceed 90, but in some cases could be lower due to partial voluming of a thin jet of contrast mixing with regular fluid. So you just need to be careful in that regard. Uh, in terms of blood, I think, you know, here are some quotes from Willman talking about the trauma setting. But regardless, those numbers tend to hold true. Extravasated contrast, well over 100, as high as 300. Again, the uh, brightness, how bright it is, how much it enhances, will be very dependent on your timing of acquisition and also the speed of injecting contrast. Slow injection, you may not see anything and things will not get as bright as it would with a very rapid injection. So here's just a couple uh, examples. This is a 73-year-old male, prior history of th radiation therapy for prostate cancer. Two weeks ago, had an artificial urinary sphincter, an inflatable penile prosthesis placed. Now the patient has rectal bleeding. And you can see very nicely on all of the views, this high attenuation, focal lesion in the rectum, and that's the site of active bleeding. Colonoscopy was performed and noted severe radiation proctitis. And this was treated with argon plasma coagulation, but again, very nice example. Another case, patient with hepatic failure, unknown cause of GI bleeding. Uh, look at the cecum there. Um, what is going on there? There's a round, high-density structure. When you look at it, you say, gee, you know, this is a beautiful example of bleeding. Then you realize it doesn't change from the various sequences, and you realize later that what this is is um, a pill, probably in the patient's colon. Again, something that bleeds changes density from the arterial to venous typically. And this is just a good example of why you might do a non-contrast scan first. Another example, patient post Whipple's. Very nice example of a pseudoaneurysm, inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery, nicely shown on the CT angiogram, and nicely confirmed on angiography when embolization was indeed performed. Another example, GI bleeding, again following Whipple's procedure. You see those very bright areas, it stands out nicely against the water and bowel. A very nice example of active extravasation. Or this next case. This is a patient two days post right colon polypectomy. Again, look at that bright blush. Uh, very, very clear that this is active bleeding in the right colon. Uh, this was at the polypectomy site. The patient was again treated conservatively, but just very impressive visualizations. Well, what about this case? GI bleeding, patient has diverticulitis, and you can see very nicely that there's an AVM in the descending colon. You can see the blush and you can see the swirl of the AVM down there, very nicely shown on these images. Or in this case, patient has cirrhosis and hematemesis. Look at the patient's stomach. Uh, active bleeding, contrast extravasation in the gastric lumen, just very, very impressive. Almost looks like oral contrast material, but it was given none. Or this example, 19-year-old abdominal pain, melena, and you can see very nicely the terminal ileum's thickened. We can pad with Crohn's with enhancement. We don't see contrast extravasation, but at least you made the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Um, and this can be assumed to be the cause of patient's bleeding. So I've covered a number of different cases. Um, we'll just conclude then saying CT has a great potential for GI bleeding. With ever faster scanning, it's going to become even easier to do. But again, you can't be in the axial world, you need to be in the volume world. The potential for picking up things on 3D mapping is a lot higher. So it's something that needs to be done. Uh, we're looking at this with our newer scanners, which take one to two seconds in the whole abdomen. And this may also increase our ability to detect GI bleeding. So it's something I think you should be doing.
Uh, I think it's something that you can be successful in, and it's definitely a problem clinically and something we can definitely help with. And with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention.